Hello again everyone, and this time we're going to be wrapping up the Cold War, for the most part, by looking at Asia and the Middle East. You should be looking at the, viewing this after viewing the Cold War in Africa and Latin America, as this is week 12, topic 2. Again, I'll show you these upcoming dates we have. I already mentioned them last time, so I won't spend a ton of time on them right now, but I just want you to be aware of them again. Please look over these if you have any questions. If you have any questions about what I expect or when this stuff is due or where to turn it in, please do let me know as soon as possible. Now, to get things started, the, big, the biggest early event that set the stage for the Cold War in Asia was the Communist Revolution in China. Actually, one thing we didn't have time to talk about yet is that the Communists and Nationalists in China had actually been fighting a civil war since the 1920s. However, as you might imagine, during the, the World War II, they joined forces to fight the Japanese together in 1936, which, if you remember from last time, is when the Japanese were invading Manchuria. However, by the time the war was over, Mao Zedong, this chipper-looking man right here, won a series of victories in the war and forced the president at the time, Chiang Kai-shek, to flee to Taiwan, which, as you might be aware, is sort of a reason why Taiwan is still a bit of a touchy issue, between us and China. I do want to take just a second to talk about what Mao's communism was like, because it actually was a bit different than the Soviet Union's plan. For him, the peasantry in China would serve as the revolutionary vanguard. This is because in China, the huge portion of the population were peasants living out in various rice fields, farms, whatever it might be. Whereas in Russia, the, the Marxists there wanted the working class and the um, factory workers to be the leaders of the revolution. He believed that fighting that agricultural freedom was more important than fighting the means of production or essentially fighting the factory owners. Just a bit of an interesting philosophical difference. Also, and we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go on hopefully, his form of revolution was also characterized by a cultural revolution. This is where he would destroy any pre-communist Chinese culture. He believed that any culture reminding the, the people of China's imperialist past could damage the communist revolution. So he would destroy books, destroy art, lock up and or execute academics like myself. So good thing I didn't live there. And there's very other people, uh, very, uh, various other individuals who might try to remind people what China used to be like. Because of this, China, um, throughout the years 1956 and 1966, and for various other reasons we'll talk about, as I kind of hinted at last time, China and the USSR actually split um, ideology, 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 split ideology, and sort of broke most of their diplomatic ties between this time. So again, this is why both the groups arguably were never able to quite achieve what they wanted to because they couldn't really work together. So this Chinese revolution scared a lot of people, which helped us get involved in Korea. Following the Potsdam conference in 1945 which you remember from last time is when the three major allied leaders, you can see Stalin right here, a couple of the others are in here as well, I believe, but I'm not going to look for them right now. We're going to decide what to do with the world after they defeated the Axis powers. America, China, and Great Britain at this conference agreed Korea would be free and independent and after they got liberated from Japan. After the, war was, after the war was over, General Douglas MacArthur, who was one of the Pacific War commanders at the time, gave a surrender plan. In this plan, Japanese troops north of the 38th parallel would surrender to the USSR. Troops in the south would surrender to the United States. I'm sure you could probably see where this is going if you know a little bit about the Korean War. What's probably going to happen with this plan? Do you think either group is going to be happy with just having half the country? The short answer, of course, is no. So, prelude to war. This is the infamous truce line, or the 38th parallel, right here. In 1945, Stalin almost immediately closed off all access north of the 38th parallel. No one else could get in who wasn't communist allied. 1948, the UN, the UN sent delegates to try to supervise free elections, and were, of course, denied access to the north. So the south had at least relatively free elections. The north had no free elections. By 1950, North Korea had already crossed the 38th parallel and very quickly defeated the South Korean army. Truman, quickly tried, Truman, who was president at the time, quickly tried to supply South Korean troops, but it unfortunately wasn't enough. As a result, the UN quickly declared a resolution where, led by the United States where they called a special session of the Security Council. 
The Security Council, if you don't know, is a part of the UN where certain um, nations which rotate every so often are basically in charge of making decisions to try to promote peace and security throughout the world, especially trying to stop conflicts and stop um, international aggression. This shows how powerful the United States was in the early years of the United Nations because of our military power. We were able to call a Security Council meeting and basically bully or force everyone else to go along with our plan. We eventually demanded that the North Korea withdraw and other UN members to give Air America every assistance they could in pushing the North Koreans out of the South. Because at this point, as you can see here on this map, the, mo the most southernmost invasion had reached to the southeastern tip of the entire country. So they only had this tiny little bit of the country left, and North Korea had overrun everything else. Early on, the war was relatively decent for the Americans. By 1950, MacArthur had decided he could only send troops to Korea by piecemeal, because the army was already much smaller than it used to be. Just to give you an idea, the armed forces throughout the army, and this doesn't even include the Navy and the Air Force, only had the Army had 591,000 men compared to the 8,267,958 it had in 1945. The 8th Army went alone, as you can see here, at first. They um, fought, they were pushed back beyond the Nakatong River at first at the Battle of Taejon. So again, first initially, this is not going very well. They got pushed all the way down to this area. However, the Reese forces did arrive and they were able to recapture Seoul, the capital of South Korea, on September 27th. On October 1st, South Korea actually went, were emboldened by their victory, invaded North Korea, causing Truman to order UN troops to follow. Is this going to be a good idea? Just to give you a hint, what's this country up here, north of North Korea? China. How well do you think they're going to take this invasion? Well, we'll find out together. So, the time turned once again. The Chinese quickly launched a counteroffensive because they did not like having capitalist and Western troops so close to their border. This is actually why, if you watch the news again, if you've watched the news a lot, you'll see that China is still pretty supportive of North Korean troops. There's actually, or North Korea, there's actually a big news story, I believe, just last year where we saw China bringing in um, supplies to a North Korean harbor during one of our embargoes. So China still supports North Korea for the most part because, again, they don't really like having people support who are too close to European and Western powers right on their border. So they sent in 200,000 troops and pushed back the UN troops at the Battle of Unsan and also in participated in the Chosin Reservoir ambush, which you can see right here in which 120,000 troops ambushed UN troops and causing, and causing such bad, horrible casualties that the 31st Infantry Regiment alone suffered 3,000 casualties, which were most of its troops. On January 4, 1951, UN troops were pushed south again of Seoul to the port of Incon, which I believe you can see on this map. So yeah, they were pushed south down to here again. So they were pushed out of North Korea back south of the 38th parallel. MacArthur, as we mentioned, I mentioned earlier, MacArthur had been a uh, Pacific commander in the world in World War II and had been largely in charge of the United States and UN's actions in Korea. He decided he wanted to go on the on the offensive. He sent UN troops to the to the Chinese border during the early offensive, and he actually bombed the Yalu bridges. This might not sound like a big deal, just bombing bridges in a war, but unfortunately for him. Some of these bridges, you can see here, the Yulu, Yalu River is on the border. Some of these bridges stretched out into China. So he was actually bombing Chinese territory. He actually got to the point where he called for an invasion of China after the second recapturing of Seoul in March 1951. They did act, they ended up capturing it again. But part of this, this was actually a response to a protest against the Die for Thai plan of the UN. At this point, the UN had realized that they couldn't really go to war without really go to war without bringing in China, so they just wanted to fight to preserve South Korea, causing soldiers like this to come up with the "Die for Thai" slogan. However, MacArthur's plan was not very popular, and he was actually relieved of his command on April 11th, 1951. So, naturally, why do you think MacArthur was fired? Obviously, as I've already mentioned, basically mentioned, it's because he was about to risk open war with China, which could of course bring in the USSR as well. Do you think Truman made the right decision? 
That's something, again, we'll hopefully discuss in the future. Please keep that in mind. Now, peace talks and violence, as is often in war, still went on at the same time. Armist talks, the armist talks actually lasted for over two years, starting on the 30th of June to the 1951 to lasting till July 1953. Most of the reasons these talks were suspended is because both sides weren't really willing to give in on a lot of the other's demands, so they try to fight each other to force the other to accept their demands. For example, at Bloody Ridge and Heartbreak Ridge, as you can see here in this picture, 6,000 American casualties occurred during these peace talks. And between June and August of 1952, UN troops also invaded the Eula River again. So again, they're getting on this border to try to upset China. And they actually bombed Pyongyang, which is the capital of North Korea. I think I actually pronounced that right, and I'm very proud of myself. Finally, everyone got tired of the violence, and on July the 27th, 1953, both sides signed the armistice and withdrew two kilometers from their current positions, which led to, as we know it today, the demilitarized zone. South Korea and South Korea and any other nation are not allowed to have any weapons or any military presence within this demilitarized zone. Now, one thing I do want to mention that's going to be a common theme for a while now is what does this um, outcome of the Korean War reveal about what armed conflict was like during the the Cold War? Well, as you can probably see, the big issue is that we can't really get all of our goals because we can't wage complete war. Because like you said here, if you wage complete war in a country that's allied with a superpower, that superpower is going to get involved. So in this case, of course, was China. So you don't really want to risk an open war and actually totally conquer your enemy. Because if you do, you could risk a huge world war and this mutually assured destruction again. So, like Korea was sort of has seen as sort of the classic example of a Cold War conflict. You can't really accomplish what you want to accomplish. However, and for those of you who especially who are writing about medical, scientific, and technological advances, Korea did have an interesting legacy. It was when the Mobile Army Surgical Hospitals were introduced in the United States military, or as we probably you probably know them, MASH units. They specialize, as you can see here, in short-term recovery. They only stabilize the patients. It wasn't where you were going to get completely healed or fixed or whatever was going on. However, despite this, they did help raise the survival ratings of wounded troops to 97 to 98%, which is very high and much, much higher than when back during the Civil War, they would just hold your head down while they sawed your leg off. So obviously, this is a, much, this is a very significant improvement. It's actually inspired the hit MASH TV series from 1972, which, or which aired from 1972 to 1983. I'm not going to play it now, but I do highly recommend you check this um, Myth Kitchen Rebel scene. It sort of shows one of the best characters in the whole show and how funny the show can be. But I digress. In the interest of time, I want to go ahead and move on to Vietnam, which is, of course, the most infamous conflict from the American perspective in the entire Cold War. Vietnam's problems began all the way back in the 1880s during that period of imperialism we were talking about. This is when France claimed Vietnam as a colony. By 1921, Ho Chi Minh had created the Viet Minh, which was a nationalist independence party. This group fought against the French colonists for French colonists for years. In World War II, things got even more complicated and worse for the Vietnamese. Actually, Vietnam at the time actually was a co-French and Japanese colony, because if you remember, France was actually con conquered by the Axis powers during World War II. So they had conflicting orders from fr the French and the Japanese trying to rule them at the same time. This actually was so bad that it led to 2 million Vietnamese starving throughout the war. Interestingly enough, as some pe many people don't know, the United States actually supported Ho Chi Minh in his conflict against the Japanese. Obviously, because he, obviously he tried to fight the Japanese, we actually helped him. The U.S. would later support France in an attempt to regain control of Vietnam. Why do you think we would do this? Well, man, so we've been an ally for France for years, as you might imagine. And again, you don't want us, you have, want to stop that spread of communism, and you want to stop the too many independence movements from their perspective. Also, how, see, how is Ho Chi Minh going to react? As you might imagine, he actually felt very betrayed by the United States' actions, and this caused him to hate America as much as he had already hated France. And so, un unfortunately for us, from our perspective, 
Immediately after the war was over and he realized France wasn't going to give up its control, he started the First Indochina War from 1945 to 1954. At the end, the French abandoned Vietnam and it was split into northern and southern halves. Ho Chi Minh and the communists got the north. Ngo Dinh Diem, if I'm pronouncing that right, got the south. Now, I'm going to quickly go over some of the major battles because I want us to talk a little bit more about the legacy of Vietnam, which I think is the most important part of this war. So just to really briefly break it down, from 1961 to 64, the U.S. was not officially involved and only gave aid. So again, they're not really, they don't want to wage war directly because they saw what almost happened again in Korea with China. For our Operation Rolling Thunder, however, we did start bombing the supply line to Ho Chi Minh Trail. But again, this shows a limited, um, the limited effect of proxy wars. We couldn't bomb the whole thing because it could be, some of it got into China. Uh, for, um, phew, excuse me, sorry, excuse me a moment. And for, there was an infamous Aya Drong battle, which you might have seen depicted in some movies, actually, where airborne troops are dropped into a valley and bush of 300 casualties. The Battle of Long Ve shows again the communist involvement in this war. North Vietnamese actually used Russian tanks to attack a Green Beret outpost at Long Ye, Long Ve, if I'm pronouncing that right, and killed half of them. The most infamous attack of the war, as you can see depicted here, was the Tet Offensive, which was where the Viet Cong or um, North Vietnamese guerrilla soldiers operating in the south attacked the U.S. Embassy in Saigon reason this is so significant to remember is it showed Americans and the world that even their most their most prized government buildings in South Vietnam weren't safe from attack. The war got even worse from an international perspective when during throughout the Cambodian bombings when Nixon started to bomb Cambodia to hurt the supply lines. Because again, we were limited in attacking some of the trails because of China, but he was willing to bomb Cambodia. Obviously, however, this made the war into more of an international war and scared a lot of people. Finally, we thought the war was so useless and unwinnable that by 1975, the last U.S. troops pulled out of Vietnam and Saigon actually fell on April 30th. So not only was this an unsuccessful war like the Korean War, we actually were defeated, arguably, and abandoned the country and it was completely taken over by the communists. Now, the reason I want to focus on this, the reason I want to go through the battles relatively quickly is, like I said, I want to talk more about the problems with Vietnam. One of the reasons that so many people had issues with us being involved in Vietnam and didn't like us being there at all is because there was huge amounts of corruption on both sides of the government, so it was difficult to know who to support. DM, the president we initially supported in the South, was actually infamous for persecuting Buddhists, locking up peasants in forts, nepotism as well, which um, if you don't know, nepotism is where you basically give political jobs and resources and wealth to your allies and you just let everyone else do without. And he also had rigged elections and supported a secret police. What you can see here is actually one of the most infamous and brutal forms of protest in human history, I would argue, is when to protest his persecution of the of Buddhists, several monks actually went to public streets and lit themselves on fire in front of crowds in order to protest the treatment. This is the very first monk who participated in this. His name was Thich Quang Duke, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And actually, his dedication was so strong that it was uh, recorded by everyone involved that he never made a sound or move while he was burning. There are actually recordings of this. I won't force you to watch this if you don't want to. I would recommend skipping past this. But I did just want to pull it up just very quickly. Come on, I know what hyper... Alright, you guys might be safe. I don't know if it's going to pull it up. Alright. I'll let you look at that on your own. That actually probably seems like the most responsible thing to do. I don't want to force anyone who's a bit squeamish. But again, this is the end result. One of the most infamous forms of protest. Ho Chi Minh was not really any better. He practiced purification of Vietnam, which is where he wanted to get rid of all imperialist and colonial legacies and get a whole country on board with his Marxist ideology. Potentially involved in 13,000 plus executions, political suppression, and there are actually quite a few mass graves from these killings discovered after the Tet Offensive, for example. So again, both very violent and very corrupt individuals. So a lot of people didn't want us involved in either side of this war. The unpopularity of this war is also obviously infamous. This was encouraged, particularly in America, by the My Lai Massacre, which occurred early on in the war. <coughs> Excuse me. 
By in the Journey's Massacre, um, ranges from 150 to possibly 500 plus Vietnamese citizens were murdered by U.S. troops. I have here a few of the uh, few accounts to show what this um, of these massacres were like, and you can see some of the survivors here. Sergeant Michael Bernhardt said, "I saw them shoot an M79 grenade launcher into a group of people who were still alive, but it was mostly done with a machine gun. They were shooting women and children just like anybody else." Another survivor, another participant said, We met no resistance and I only saw three captured weapons. We had no casualties. It was just like any other Vietnamese village. Only Papa Sons, men, women, and kids. As a matter of fact, I don't remember seeing any one military aged male in the entire place, dead or alive. Thompson, someone named Thompson said, We kept flying back and forth and it didn't take very long until we started noticing the large number of bodies everywhere. Everywhere we'd look, we'd see bodies. There were infants, two, three, four, five-year-olds, women, very old men, no draft-age people whatsoever. So again, massacres like this were not uncommon for various reasons I'm going to speculate on in just a second. Once the public heard about these instances like these, it made the war even more unpopular. And it's actually because of instances like this where children were hurt, where you would get the popular um, baby killer insult that were given to Vietnamese veterans. Some of your relatives who might have been participating in Vietnam might have heard these insults when they got back from the war. So again, obviously not every soldier participated in things like this, but they got such an infamous reputation that it basically soured the public's opinion towards the entire war. Reporter access actually made this worse. Actually, see, um, this was like one of the most reported wars in human history up to that point. Seasoned reporters and even high school newspapers were given complete access to go report the Vietnam War. So because of this, the public got a very good idea of what was going on. And it's actually because of this, as we're going to talk about in future wars, that now the, the newspapers, at their, the media's access to wars and the front is actually much more limited. We'll get there in a second. Popularity reached, uh, unpopularity arguably reached a height in the Kent State Mackis Massacre on May 4th of 1970, which you can see here, when National Guardsmen fired at student protesters and killed four people and wounded 11. So now not only in the eyes of Vietnam protesters are we killing people, innocent people, in another country, we're now shooting our own people to support this war. So again, it made the war that much more unpopular. Meanwhile, in Chicago throughout the 19, 1968 and later years, 26,000 National Guardsmen were sent to put down potential protests in the area. They beat and tear gas protesters throughout the Democratic National Convention, which was going on at the time. So again, very unpopular war with argue with what seemed to the public at least horrible violence going on in Vietnam and back at home. So again, hugely unpopular war. Also, I do want to focus on the veterans' struggle of Vietnam because this what veterans have gone through in Vietnam perhaps summarizes about as much as any other war how horrible the veteran experience can be. Prisoners of war were notably treated horribly throughout the Vietnam conflict. They were marched and beaten throughout North Vietnamese cities locked in small concrete boxes, and frequently tortured. As some of you might know, one of the most famous examples of this is actually John McCain, who was captured during, his, uh, during the Vietnam War. According to his account, and he was actually arguably treated better than some of the other prisoners because his father was actually an admirable admiral at the time. So this shows even more what some of the other prisoners might have gone through. According to John McCain, his account, which he gave after the war, he said, to get back to the story, they took me out of my room to Slopehead, who said, you violate all the camp regulations. This is the prison camp he was in at the time. You're a black criminal. You must confess your crimes. I said that I wouldn't do that. And he asked, why are you so disrespectful of guards? I answered, because the guards treat me like an animal. When I said that, the guards, who were all in the room, about 10 of them, really laid into me. They bounced me from pillar to post, kicking and laughing and scratching. After a few hours of that, ropes were put on me, and I sat that night bound with ropes. Then I was taken to a small room. For punishment, they would almost always take you to another room where you didn't have a mosquito net or a bed or any clothes. And as you might imagine, the mosquitoes were particularly bad in the jungles of Vietnam, so not having a mosquito net could be pretty terrible. For the next four days, I was beaten every two or three hours by different guards. My left arm was broken again, and my ribs were cracked. So this is just one example of what Vietnam veterans went through throughout, throughout the war. So not only were we potentially being cruel to many people throughout the war, the North Vietnamese were extremely cruel as well. So it's just a horrible, cruel war on both sides that helped to make the war even more unpopular. 
Another thing I like to focus on that I don't think gets enough attention in current wars and still Vietnam veterans is the psychological and physical trauma they went through after the war as well. One of the reasons, main reasons arguably this occurred is um, the new basic training that went on after World War II. In World War II, it was found that roughly only 15% of soldiers actually would fire their weapons in battle. They just didn't want to kill people. Because of this, they altered basic training and actively encouraged soldiers to be willing to kill in combat. Because of this, PTSD um, reported accounts went through the roof. 30% of men and 20% of, 27% of women involved in the Vietnam War have reported PTSD symptoms at some point in their life, whether it's depression, drug abuse, or some kind of nightmares. So it's um, and so with, at some point in their lives, which by the way, PTSD is obviously prolonged uh, trauma disorder. So many of these people are still showing symptoms of PTSD decades after the war. Also, fragging went up during the Vietnam War. During World War II, fragging was virtually unheard of. There were actually 200 incidents of fragging reported for incidents during the Vietnam War, which is where you would kill your own officer. Agent Orange has also been a huge deal for Vietnam veterans as well. It is estimated by the Red, which by the way, if you don't know what the um, Agent Orange is, it's a chemical that the Air Force would dump on trees across the country to try to kill the tree cover. It is estimated by the Red Cross that um, 3 million Vietnamese and 2.8 million veterans, sorry about that, have been negatively affected by the dropping of Agent Orange. Which, by the way, as I was researching for this, you can still see on the VA and different veterans and health websites links and, um, uh, links and areas to go to to get support for Agent Orange. So it's still affecting people with cancer and other health issues to this day. So... Reflection, and this is something I'm going to have you guys focus on in some of your assignments this week. How are we supposed to deal with these complex issues of Vietnam today? How should we handle stuff like this? And, perhaps more importantly, how should the Vietnam War be remembered? Should it be remembered as a heroic struggle in which we fought the forces of communism, or as a tragedy? That's up to you to decide. So, also I do want to throw in some more technology stuff for those of you who want to write about technology of war. New methods of war were also used in the Vietnam War. The most exam the most important example being the U.S. Army Air Cavalry, which you can see here. These are helicopter units that replaced the tanks and armored personal carriers that weren't really useful in the jungle. There weren't many roads in Vietnam, and it was a, and there were obviously a jungle all over the place. So you can't really drive a tank very anywhere very easily, but a helicopter can go wherever you want. The most commonly used helicopter, which you can see here, are the Bell UH-1 Huey helicopters. They would drop infantry in a landing zone, or an LZ, just like this, and clear out the space with um, M60 machine guns and rocket launchers. These units were actually so prevalent, but also so dangerous, that they actually suffered the highest casualties of the war. For example, the 1st Cavalry of the Army Air Cavalry suffered 5,444 5, men killed, and 26,592 wounded throughout the Vietnam War. Alright, to mostly wrap things up in Asia, the Cold War in Asia was mostly wrapped up, not completely as we'll talk about, but it was mostly wrapped up in 1978 when President Nixon went to China, which was the first time a president, had, a United States president, had been to China since the 1949 revolution. Because of this, by 1979, Jimmy Carter had announced that the U.S. was now finally going to recognize Communist China and would end its relations with Taiwan, which is, again, why that whole Taiwan, China, and United States relationship is still so complicated to this day. A couple of impacts of this decision. It did end most of the proxy wars in Asia. It did drive a wedge between China and the USSR. And, more, perhaps most importantly, as we can see today, it opened up China to the global economy for the first time. So this is when China began to get very involved in the global economy and is arguably why, and is why most of your products you see today come from China. Started right here. All right, in the years of time, we'll go ahead and move on to the Middle East. Iran was one of the biggest, one of the biggest areas we were involved in in the Cold War in the Middle East. Our trouble here started in 18, 1953 when the United States and the United Kingdom helped overthrow a democratically elected prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, I think, if I'm pronouncing that right, in favor of strengthening the former monarchy. This is called Operation Ajax. It was actually the first time in world history that the United States had overthrown a government during peacetime. 
This led to the 1979 revolution when the Grand Ayatollah Rudahalo Khomeini, I'm not pronouncing that right at all, overthrew this U.S.-backed monarchy and established an Islamic Republic. By the way, the Grand Ayatollah is actually a title in Shia Islam. This is a Shia Islam-backed revolu revolution. A couple of reasons why this is significant is because it was a non-violent revolution for the most part. Student demonstrations, as you can see here, but little direct violence. And it was actually a pretty prosperous country at the time. So it wasn't really about fighting against that inequality and imperialist legacy that most revolutions were about. They just wanted to get rid of all foreign influence as much as they could and establish a religious-backed government. Because of this and their Shia Islamic background and the desire to spread Shia Islam and Islamic revolutions throughout the Middle East, they start a few important conflicts. For example, the infamous Iran and Iraq War, where Iraq went to war against Iran to stop the spreading um, Shia revolution. Because if you don't know, the majority of Iran or Iraq is actually Sunni Islam, so they didn't really get along. This, of course, if you might, as you might be aware, is when Saddam Hussein got some of his combat starts, and it was in it where he started using his weapons of mass destruction against Iran, his chemical weapons, to help justify us going to war with them later. It also led to the infamous Iran hostage crisis, where our, where our diplomats were taken hostage for over a year to protest our lack of acknowledging their revolution and their new government. Finally, it also helped cause the Six-Day War and the infamous Arab oil crisis. This is when we supported Israel in a war with Arab countries like Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. And by, because of that, in protest, Arab nations like Iran responded by raising oil prices and placing embargoes on our oil, so our oil prices went through the roof. So if you think our oil gas prices now, or at least before the coronavirus, are terrible, it was much worse after this. Next major play area of conflict in the Middle East was Afghanistan. This was due to the Soviet-Afghan War, from 1979 to 1989. Because the Soviet Union was emboldened by the success of areas such as um, Libya and Africa and uh, Cuba and Vietnam, they decided that they were going to try to spread their ideology throughout the Middle East and invaded Afghanistan. In response to this, the Mujahideen, which it roughly translates to Jihad Warriors, began a guerrilla war against the Afghan Republic and the USSR, while they were being backed by the U.S., the United Kingdom, and our allies, Saudi Arabia. Because of this, the Soviet Union started their own coup and got rid of President... Ha I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. But the current president of Afghanistan was overthrown and a public government was set up in its place. Interestingly enough, excuse me, this is one, actually was one area some historians and global experts point to as the start of modern global terrorism. Because many of the Mujahideen included future terrorists, such as Osama bin Laden. Many of you probably know him as the mastermind of the September 11th attacks. He was actually originally an American ally and was funded by us to help fight against the USSR and the Afghan Republic. So again, it shows the complexity of these Cold War conflicts. A lot of times we end up getting backing horrible people. Finally, the UN voted to condemn the Soviet invasion, and the US infamously boycotted the 1988 Olympics in Moscow. And by 1989, the Soviet troops withdrew, and as the USSR began to decline, as we'll talk about next week, and the rebels successfully took over the country by 1992. And you can see here some more of the Mujahideen. Alright, that's all I have for right now. In the interest of time, I won't hold you here too long. But again, thank you for participating in the class. Please let me know if you have any more questions. And here's some more of your upcoming dates. Have a great rest of your week, and let me know if I can be of any help.